are. Um, so this talk, Getting the Job Done, WordPress Development Toolkit, it really came out of um, Jen and I give talks on a regular basis, and we often end up in hallway conversations for 15 to 30 minutes about the tools we use and debating what's better or worse. And um, so we want to talk about the current state of our own, um, because it's also something that we love hearing about from other shops and agencies. Okay, so just a quick overview of what we're going to talk about so you know what to expect. We're going to do introductions so you know who we are. We're going to talk about our process, so how we go about developing sites. We're going to talk, um, hopefully, uh, have time to go into some of the nitty gritties of how we're doing our development and some of the tools that we're using. Um, and then at the end, if we have time, we can, you guys can share what you're doing, how you're doing things. Maybe we can take some questions. And if not, we'll hang around afterwards and you can um, so, I am Shines, and this is Jekka. Um, I am the chief web mechanic, so I am the person who makes the engine go, what's under the hood, run well. And Jen is the chief pixel surgeon, and she is the person who cares about the form and the aerodynamics and how the form and function meet together for a great sleek visual design. Uh, we met and first started working together about 14 years ago, um, right here at USM, actually. And we started our company, Shine Projector Laboratories, 10 years ago. Um, and we chose laboratories uh, for a number of reasons, but one of them is because we all, a core value that we share is that um, we want to have an environment created for building, experimenting, and teaching, as well as a company that's making cool sites and, and being profitable. Um, our typical clients are now agency work, so marketing agencies that need a technical backbone, and some larger ongoing clients that um, have big maintenance needs and tools developed for them. Uh, we build almost entirely custom WordPress installs, so that means custom themes, custom design, custom plugins, and um, a web project of ours typically involves about four to six people or roles. Um, a project manager, a developer, a designer, a content and tech support person, and occasionally a photographer as well. We do also want to say that we don't typically cover, um, we do plenty of search engine optimization, but we don't do search engine campaigns or marketing like that. We also don't typically do e-commerce work, and we almost never use site builders. Okay, so let's get started. Um, we just want to go through sort of what our process is for a typical site. Um, overall process is important. It's good to have a standard and an understanding because um, then you have a pattern and you can repeat it and you can improve on it to make it run better and also understand risk points and where things might you know, go off the rails. Um, I will say we're talking about our preferred process, but if you've worked with clients or you've worked on other sites, you know that every client's different, every project is unique. Um, so, although ideally we would like to do this in every instance, we do want to recognize that sometimes steps get skipped, they're out of order. Um, so we just want to sort of lay these out to give you an idea. Um, and these soft skills and processes are just such an important part of uh, project success beyond the technology that we decide to use. So the first thing we do is we have an interview questionnaire before we commit to any work. We want to ensure that they're happy we work on referral. Um, if, if it's an inappropriate match, if we can't make them happy and meet their goals, then we're not going to get a great referral. So we want to, as early in the process, determine should we continue on with this project and do a proposal or not. Yeah, and so out of that questionnaire, we can usually get some priorities of the client. And some of these would be like, what are their goals for their website? Clients should always have some clear goals because then you can meet those goals and then they have something to measure whether or not the project was a success. Budget is also very important. Um, having them know what their budget is going in, quite often if, uh, if someone comes to you and they don't know what their budget is, it means they haven't spent enough time thinking about what they really want um, and so they probably need to take a step back and you can certainly help them with that process. Timeline is important. Is there any sort of event or um, need that the client has that you need to meet and what is your current workload sometimes really busy can't take projects on because of the timeline 
And then, of course, technology. Do they have certain technical requirements? Is that a good fit for you? Um, can you accommodate them? And most importantly, it's your first gut read of um, the people that you're going to be working with. Um, what are the early indications of whether or not you're going to be a good match? Do you, are you able to communicate well? Um, what do they need? Where are the handholds? The handholding going to need to occur within the project? That you can figure out pretty early in the process. Yeah, like have they worked with WordPress before? That's a useful thing to know. Okay. Um, and then I think what's really important going into any project is what is our or your priorities as either a company or a developer for your personal um, skills. So for us, these are some of our priorities when we're evaluating on the project. We want to build client-friendly sites that elevate the content, that are backed by really good code that is accessible, and performant. And when we're doing the work, we want to use best practices, we want to use cutting edge tools, make a polished design at the end, and have a smooth development and deployment process. And along the way, we want to work on something that levels up our own skills. So we evaluate these things, and if we think it's a good match, we put together a proposal. And if it's accepted, we move into discover, research, plan. This is sort of the prep work ahead of um, building a website. Since we do a lot of work with agencies, quite often they'll do a lot of the heavy lifting in this, but um, we still need to know a lot about the client, some of the background, what are their goals, um, and planning is really, really important for a successful project. Um, and so at this point is when we start actually putting dates, we map out the calendar, we have a timeline for when we expect things to get done and when certain things are due either from us or the client. Um, and we come up with a list of deliverables. What are we going to be handing off to the client in the end? What can they expect? Um, we do sort of a tech check. So what kind of technology access do we need? Probably access to um, DNS. Do they have any APIs they're using? If they have a current site, we need access to that so we can potentially move content, Google Analytics, all those sorts of things that you have to check off. Um, and then, as any project, or many projects, whoever is doing the interview and the proposal quite often is different than who's going to be part of the project team. So who are the stakeholders? Who are you going to be working with? And sort of get up to speed for that part of the, the process. So the next step, and I will like sort of stop and say these aren't necessarily sequential. Quite often some of these things are happening, happening at the same time. But I am a big fan of starting content very, very early in the process because content is really what you're doing. You're supposed to be featuring their content. So if you're doing a design, it should support whatever content that they've decided to have. So I always push for content very early in the process, especially if the client's doing their own content. They never have a good expectation of how much time it's going to take. Um, it is probably the most time-consuming part of the entire project. Building the site is easy, I think, compared to gathering content, writing content. It is, it is the highest risk point that we have yeah. in a project. If, if they say, oh, I'm totally going to do all the content, and I will edit it and do everything, and it's going to take me like two weeks, I'll get it right back to you. That, that's, that's Maybe if they've built the site before, they have some, yeah. some understanding of that. But in a, And also, again, you know, it doesn't have to be done perfectly, but having at least some um, structure around the content. So I know I'm going to have news articles, I want to have a headline, I want to have a sub-headline, there's going to be some sort of external link, and kind of mapping that out. Also doing an inventory or an audit of current content that's maybe going to move over, is it going to get rewritten, um, and then also gathering assets. This is a great time to start thinking about, do you need to hire a photographer because you want new headshots for your website? Where are all the logos? The designer that created them years ago, you need to track them down. Um, so just sort of gathering content should start happening really early in the process. And um, before we do anything, we should uh, also cover the most important rule that we have. If it isn't documented, it was never done. Um, this is applicable for lots and lots of things, but the really key things at this point is to have documentation of the hosting environment and maintenance decisions. If you find out, oh, I was expecting to host on our own 
environment that I'm totally familiar with. Uh, uh, and then in the end, you need to be working with a shared hosting environment, and you didn't anticipate that, that can be a lot of work later on. Having a scope of work, design brief, documenting all the non-web requirements, who's hosting email, um, do you need to touch that at all? And then the most important piece of what we do is we have a functional spec for every single project. A functional spec is essentially a list of all of the templates that we will be creating for a particular site, all of the globals, the header, the footer, and um, any short codes that we need to produce for that particular client. And this is documenting down to a pretty fine grain detail what exactly needs to be the functionality power of the site. And this saves our butt all the time, because if we are documenting it early enough in the process, then anytime there's a change, we're able to reflect back and say, hey, this is what we originally agreed to. Do we need to change the budget? Do we need to do a change order? How, like, can we replace something else? Um, so it's about documenting it and sharing it with the client so that they go, yeah, yeah, no, I'm on board with that. And that you have that paper trail to cover you. And it's not just holding them accountable or approving what you said you were going to do. It's also like we forget what we say we're going to do, especially yeah. if a project is like, we're going to be done in four months, and then it's 12 months. Yeah. We're not going to remember what we said in the early part. So being able to refer back to that document and say, oh, yeah, this is supposed to be a file upload. Oh, right, they're going to have a slider here. OK, so hopefully we understand the client at this point and their project, and you've got a proposal and the budget's all set. And we definitely made um, some technical choices because we produced all this documentation. We have our functional spec. Um, we've got some at least content or at least idea of the content and some assets. So we got logos, we got fonts, maybe some photography. And we've got, again, the documentation. Um, and so now we're actually ready to do the fun part, I think, which is build the site. Yeah. And we're going to talk about uh, the development tools a little bit later. We're going to give a really quick and high level review of the development process we use. OK, so I do the front end and visual piece. Um, so one of the key important parts for this step is doing some sort of wireframing. Um, this can be super low fidelity, pen and paper, on a whiteboard, or you can get fancier with you know, specialty software, or you can even wireframe with HTML. Um, but basically, if you're not familiar with wireframing, it's taking, we take the functional spec, we know sort of what the content's going to be, and we sort of block out um, you know, a map of each template so um, we have some idea of how it's going to it's going to lay out or where the pieces need to be. And this is also super helpful because quite often there's things that come out in wireframing that we didn't think about when we're writing our functional spec because our fun functional spec is quite often an outline document. When we start drawing on a board, we're like, oh yeah, there's going to be a drop down. How's that going to work in this instance? So this is pretty important um, step and it really doesn't have to be, I think a lot of times with budget, it sort of can get dropped. It doesn't have to be super time consuming and it's really going to help you later on. Um, the other piece of this is actual the actual visual design. Um, working with agencies, quite often they have a designer in-house, so I might get PSDs that I need to use to um, write CSS and HTML to make the website look like what the PSD is. Um, it really depends. It might be a sketch file. It depends on the designer's preference. <coughs> If we do the design in-house, which we do sometimes, I'm very comfortable writing code, so I tend to just skip um, and not use graphic software to design. I just start right in the browser, um, write some markup, write the CSS. Um, and then we take the design, especially if I'm getting a static file from a client, and I start writing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to create the visual front end and what it will look like. And at the same time, mostly concurrently, um, we're implementing the functionality. And I don't want to skim over it too much, um, but basically for us this comes down to, is the functional spec well implemented? If it is, we go through and we implement that functionality, just go right down. And we're spitting it out onto the templates. It should have conditional 
Like, there's no design. We just need to have the WordPress admin as done as possible so that we can start getting content in. And as the visual design is then completed and the markup is written, then we can come back and integrate the two together. Um, and we're doing this with JavaScript, PHP, and SQL. So, like, the functional spec might say we're going to have a template for um, classes or something. Yeah, or, or dealers. Like, a client has a bunch of dealers and they need to list them in, in a dealer search. We're going to need a custom post type with, with a dealer and address. Um, it always needs to default to main, and uh, they're going to have a phone number and a website. I'm just going to make sure we have all of those fields, and then I'm just going to output them to the front end, um, appropriately conditioning that, appropriately adding conditionals so that it doesn't show up if it's not there. Okay, and then content. This is where we've got back end done, so that's all the functional piece, the admin piece, uh, hopefully the visual design is done, and then someone, whether it's us or the client, um, is moving content, adding new content. Um, and this, again, is a great place to, or often is, a place where you find things that you didn't consider in the functional spec and also the design. So we had a site recently where the designer had designed a really nice looking um, case study and then we did the programming and we made it so it was like supposed to be just one line. The client actually wrote two paragraphs for that. So we had to go back and amend the functional spec and say, okay, actually this is going to be a different input field. The design had to change because the font was like this big and it had to squeeze it down. So moving the content will also usually require some adjustments on design and functionality. Which is why we get to review and adjust. We need to do an all-hands meeting at the end. Um, look at our, our checklist of what's been documented and actually go through and figure out where are the missing pieces, where do we have code that is um, not available. And one really key rule to keep in mind during this is uh, if it isn't documented, it was never done and uh, or, or approved. approved and you can't charge for that. Um, so if there's a big enough chain, we want to have that documented so that we can then go back and say we need to do some adjustments along the way in order to meet the budget that was laid out. So we do. We're big on documentation. We, we are. We're a little <laughs> big on documentation. Um, so change the functional spec. You know, email confirm the change. Uh, if you talk on the phone or you have an in-person meeting, just write up an overview. It doesn't have to be long or complicated, but write up that overview to capture the date, the conversation, and the decision. This helps with my memory, too, because a lot of times I'm like, I get burned in my head what we originally agreed, and then if there's a change, if I can't actually look up what we said, I'm just going to do what we originally said. Yeah. So we've done the visual design functionality content, we've reviewed everything and buttoned everything up. So we launch. I'm sorry, yeah. we test. Test. We can't <laughs> launch without testing. <laughs> what was I saying? Um, so there's obviously some sort of testing throughout the process. What a place you have, by the way. I'm sorry? That's I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> we do some thorough testing. Um, so there's definitely testing that goes along the way because, you know, we want to make sure it looks good in some browsers that your client might be looking at. So you're probably doing some level of browser testing before they even look at the site the first time. Um, there's a bunch of different kinds of tests that you can do. Um, you know, you might do user testing if you have a really awesome budget, that's great. Um, but some of the things that we always typically do, no matter what, we browser test to make sure how does it look in different devices, different operating systems, different browsers. Validation of your code is huge, especially quite often. There's something that looks weird, validate your code. You can usually find it's usually a div that isn't closed or a paragraph. Um, accessibility testing, we make that a priority on every site, no matter if the client is a priority for the client or not. Um, it's a priority for us, so we make sure we're testing for accessibility. And then, of course, just general debugging to make sure that the site is running smoothly. So then we launch. <laughs> but we're not quite done yet. Um, we also need to consider post-launch and maintenance because... Um, this is important. Yeah. It, we did not do this well in the beginning of our company. Um, you want to talk early in the project about who's maintaining the site because when you build it, uh, they will expect you to maintain it. And if you haven't agreed to what is the charge structure on how you maintain it, how long are you responsible for minor edits, are you responsible for maintaining it in exactly the same state that you launched it, 
or are you responsible for editing it because they had their needs changed? Knowing who's going to be doing that regular work early on will help you better constrain the client's expectations along the way. And the relationship, because yeah. you could build a site for someone, they're like, no, no, we're going to host it, and then it breaks, and they call you, and you're like, well, we got to charge you hourly, and they're like, well, you built it, like, yeah. you're responsible for it, and so you got to lay that out pretty early, like, what, what does that actually mean when you build a site, and who's going to take care of it later? So, we typically only work on sites that we maintain, um, which... Uh, we also incentivize in our pricing structure clients to do that because it makes our lives so delightfully easily easier if we know what our system is and we know who has access. Basically, the only person in the company that's FTP access is me, and I'm not supposed to use it. Um, so we have deployment structures in place. Um, so yeah, it, it's a lot easier for us if they're working on our system. We learned that the hard way. Okay, so um, this part we're going to sort of talk about some of our development um, environment, our tools we use. This changes and evolves. I am doing things differently than I did six months ago sometimes. Um, just because the tools change, the technology change, browsers get smarter and cooler. Um, and so hopefully if we have time we can sort of like hear some of the things that you guys are doing. So wait, before we go there. Um, just a quick reference for the room, like how many people are typically editing WordPress um, through a code editor? And how many people are typically interacting with WordPress online? Like code with a browser? Code editor versus a browser, okay. What's a code editor? So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so like a text editor. Like so, notepad? I'm sorry? Like notepad? Like notepad. Um, so when we, when when we're editing, we're editing things which are code, um, and you might be editing things through the web interface. Yeah. And I use Visual Studio Code. I just switched over to that because I want to try it out. You use Sublime Text. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. So this is our environment. So um, we host our sites on WP Engine. It's a managed WordPress host. Um, they're pretty fantastic. They're a little expensive, but um, they're worth it. They're totally worth it. They have great backups. You're able to roll up um, staging servers really quickly. Um, staging server being a direct copy of your site, um, so that in a different environment, so that you are able to, uh, you know, beat on it with a hammer and it's not live. Um, GitHub is our version control system, um, so that allows us to track any changes within our um, code. Uh, we use Deploy HQ, which is the connection between our version control and the server environment. So that allows us to make changes and then track who pushes the changes to the server and no one is able to edit the actual server files. Yeah, so we're editing on our machines and then I push my changes to the repository, which is where we keep all our code, and deploy is the thing that then pushes it to the server. So we're hopefully not breaking things. And if we do, we know we just roll it back. back. Well, and we, we also know who broke the, the change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's some good messages, like, oh, uh, yeah. ah. There's a great XKCD, if y'all know the comic, about, about getting tired and, and your quality of code events. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Hover is what we use for domain name registrars. So if you need to register a domain name, we love Hover. Um, and Amazon Group 53, if anyone is familiar with that, is our DNS, um, our domain name server. So it makes sites faster. If anyone wants to talk to me about DNS afterwards and the pros and cons, I do highly recommend it. It makes your site much more, it makes your site significantly more performant, but it's a little bit complicated. It, some people really like it building into DNS, some people don't. So. I, don't. <laughs> I don't like doing that. Um, another important thing that we have developed um, for doing this so long is we sort of have a core repo, and repo is a term for version control, but basically we have a, a core place and um, punch list where we have things that we use over and over and over again. We build so many sites, and there are things that we just keep doing um, repetitively, and so we sort of save all of these things up in this one place so that we can copy and paste or download it every time we start a project. 
And again, we're happy to take questions about what we have included in this or not, but you can do this at whatever scale you need to do it. But having the punch list in particular, you know, so it's a heart, that's because we love our documentation on our punch list, but it, it's wonderful because it allows us, punch list is a carpentry, carpentry term, but essentially it's a checklist. Yeah, um, we just, like what needs to be done, like we got to paint the trim, we got to, you know, yeah. roll, put on the carpet, like it's traditionally like carpentry, but we call it punch list. Yeah. It's the same thing, we got to like, you know, change the font and hook up the programming and all things. Yeah. So we use a punch list. But every time we spin up a site, we know, like, I don't, I'm not entirely sure where y'all are in levels of things, but, um, like, how many revisions do we want to have in place? We don't typically want to run as many revisions as default, because that takes a huge amount of database space. So we're always going to want to change the number of revisions. We're always going to need to make sure we have access to the DNS. So we have this laid out, because we're going to need it for any project that we have. And then we also have things that we've learned over the years. So we have a default internal plugin. So we have an in-house plugin that we've written, which is all of the debugging things that we need, all of the functions we like to debugging. We always have a couple of things that we adjust in functionality. But you could do, you could construct whatever you'd like, which is what are the things that you need to spin up every site? And what are the things that you need to test and launch your site? And if you have that, then you have a pattern that you can work on with every single time. Yeah, um, like we always put our name and phone number and email on the WordPress admin dashboard. So if a client logs in or maybe someone who's not familiar with us, it's like, hey, we built your site. If you have a question, give us a call. That's in our, plug, our default plan. Yeah, clients a year or two later don't always call their web host and be like, hey, by the way, we sold the business. <laughs> and here's your new contact. And so this, the, it has the website may have an exchange with somebody new, how do they contact us? So we always have a widget, which is front and center, that says, website related things, call these people. And so yeah, all of the things that we do. We also have a scaffold, so we're writing custom plugins, so what are the things that I know I'm always gonna have my file structure in a certain way, we have in-house standards, um, we just collect that up and put that in a default plugin that we can get started with. And I have similar scaffolds for um, theme, front-end theme development, so we use underscores as our starter theme because it's great, it's got a lot of built-in functionality and it has almost zero um, design and front-end, which I like, so I'm going to start from scratch. Um, there are things about underscores that I do differently, so I, to write all my CSS, which is, um, shows what the presentation of the um, site should look like, I use SAS, which is a preprocessor for CSS. Um, I have my own way that I like to organize my files. Um, I have code that I reuse, so I have my own SAS setup that I save and throw in every time I start a new file. Um, supporting libraries. Uh, getting in the weeds a little bit, I use Gulp. Um, my Gulp setup, which helps create my CSS. It's the same every time, pretty much. Maybe the file um, directory structure is changing, but I just do these things over and over, so I, we set them up um, ahead of time, so we're not starting from scratch. And then, of course, the punch list. And this is something that is a constant evolution. We know something that we missed on one site, we add it in, because we know we want to do it every single time. And then third-party plugins, if you build a lot of sites, you probably have favorite plugins that you use over and over again. Um, these are the ones that we pretty much put on every single site. We are doing, as we said, very customized um, WordPress builds, which usually means very customized templates and very customized data. So we're using Advanced Custom Fields Pro all the time. It's amazing. And if that is something, if, depending on where you're at, that is something that's not terribly common to jump into and get a little bit more, um, like if, you, if you're dipping your toes into the first time of, uh, <laughs> um, if you're dipping your toes in for the first time to um, editing a theme or templates, Advanced Custom Field is one of the ways that you can get to um, doing something a little bit more dynamic and funky, which is pretty fun. Yeah. And then forms, I don't know when I've ever built a site where they didn't want some sort of form. We really like Gravity Forms, but I'm sure you know everyone has their favorite form software. Gravity Forms is worth the licensing fee. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. so great. 100%.
Um, we use MainWP. Um, we have a number of sites. Uh, so MainWP is a method for managing and looking at the security plugin theme updates available. Um, other information um, for all of our sites in one dashboard. Um, so that helps our client manager go through and look at, oh, I'm doing maintenance, this is what actually needs to update and look at it in one place rather than going through and looking at every single site. Yeah. And then Yoast, pretty, everyone's probably fairly familiar with Yoast. Most of the sites we put it on, especially because we're doing like marketing agency work and they want absolutely to have that installed. If we're doing a really small site, Sometimes we won't bother because it does add some overhead, but it's a great plugin and that's really to help with your um, SEO. Okay, so um, we talked about some of the things that we use as a team, some of the tools that we do and how we work. Um, we just wanted to like take a minute or two to talk about maybe some specific software. That's always my favorite thing when people talk about how they do stuff is like, what are you actually using for software or what, how are you doing these things? Um, I think I mentioned I really like SAS. If you're writing regular CSS, you should look into it. It allows you to do some more advanced things with um, CSS and, um, you know, chunk up your code and organize it nicely. Uh, I use Gulp, which is a um, task runner. Basically, you can set it up so you have a bunch of tasks that you do over and over again. Um, and it will do it automatically. So for me, that's compiling my CSS. I can. I have one set up for sprites, um, doing some minification for my JavaScript. We use GitHub for a repository. I use GitHub for Mac, which is a GUI interface. Sarah likes to use the command line. Um, and then I use Firefox for my browser. And I highly uh, recommend if you're just getting into developing that you always look at the web inspector. It has so much information. It's so such a powerful tool. Um, you can learn so much just from, from using that. I have some other image manipulation she tools that I use. She loves talking tools. If you want to talk tools, please. But we're running out of time, so I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, I, my dev setup is um, my visual, my code editor is Sublime Text. I love using a linter, which helps me format um, all of my code appropriately. PHP Tidy is a package that you could use. Um, I also love Get Gutter. Uh, just shout out for them because uh, that is amazing at letting me see what has changed since the last uh, commit to version control. And so it's much easier to go in and identify, oh, I messed up. See, that's why I like the GUI, because it shows me in the GUI. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> um, and then I turn on and off other packages as needed. Um, I use MAMP Pro or Local by Flywheel. Um, I'm playing around with Local by Flywheel. That's an application that lets you run a local install on your computer, um, which is handy if you want to do development work and not work in a live server. So uh, Local by Flywheel or MAMP Pro? Or oh. MAMP Pro. Yeah. Okay. I'm on a Mac, so. I know. Yeah. So which do you prefer? Um, I am midway between the two. Okay. I think that Local by Flywheel is great. I occasionally have needs that they cannot meet, but I'm not. You're new to it too, right? Yeah. Ignorance. Yeah. I think local by flywheel is pretty good. It does eat up a ton of memory. Um, it will it run on a PC right now? I think so. Yeah. 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 I'm pretty sure. Um, I use iTerm as a terminal, um, and the GitHub, the command line interfaces I use are GitHub. HQ and WPCLI, which if you're interested in getting the command line tools, that's a really good one to start playing with for WordPress. Um, and in Chrome, I use Inspector and the Web Developer Toolbar extension. And the one other shout out I would give is um, on a Mac, Click Menu or any Clipboard History application. As mm -hmm. I use Jump Cut. She uses Jump Cut. I use Clip Menu. If you search for clipboard history for your operating system, being able to go copy, 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 and then jump over here and go paste, 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 paste. That is amazing. And then you also have the history of like, I say clip menu. I use jump cut, but I don't know if they're still updating jump cut. Mm -hmm. so. And the other thing is, if you're doing programming, get to know your manuals. Um, Having the understanding the WordPress codex and how it's organized and what they're going to cover so that you have some comfort or familiarity. PHP or JavaScript's main 
um, manuals, they're all online. Understanding kind of how that manual is organized allows you to debug and do cooler things faster. Yeah, and I would also just say, like, there's always something new and it's really fun to try new things, but also don't be afraid to, like, use whatever works for you. If you're comfortable writing regular CSS and that works for you, that's great. You don't need to install all this stuff just because that's what I'm doing or do something else because someone else is doing it. Like, there's a lot of different options out there, so really sticking with what you're comfortable with and what makes sense, I think, is something that everyone should keep in mind. Um, these are kind of some of the testing tools that we use, uh, particularly, oh, I'm sorry, that's your slide. That's okay. <laughs> We're running out of time, so I'm going to go through these fast. These are just some of the tools. There's lots of tests you can do. You can test your code. You can use your testing. We are going to post slides online later okay. today with further information for some of the things you said out loud that was hidden because yeah. it would make the slide very messy. Yeah. Um, so this is by far not an exhaustive list, but these are some of the highlights that we like. I care deeply about accessibility, so we're using like web, um, AIM, which is a great little browser extension, um, Axe, which is also an accessibility tool that is for Chrome, uh, WC3 Validator, that can validate your code, super useful. Oh um, of finding mistakes you did not realize you put in. I know, you can go down a rabbit hole of like, I don't know, I really programmed this weird, and then you just look at your code and you're like, oh, there's just a paragraph the client didn't close or something. Um, and also that will help with its accessibility. Lighthouse, super powerful tool. It's in Chrome, um, and it's built by um, the folks over there. That's going to give you reports on performance, which is useful information, having a nice, fast, well-run site. They have um, accessibility audit in there. So if you've never played around with Lighthouse, it comes built in Chrome. It comes built in, right? Yes, yeah, it's built it's in. It's in the so that nice. Yeah. Um, there's, it's very powerful. I would recommend checking it out. Um, the other thing we might do A B testing. Um, Scrutiny for Mac is a really good link checker. Also, an SEO, um, like it'll check your SEO maps. Um, so, this is really helpful for launch. Um, Android, iOS, really early days, we made a decision that I would be Android. I would be the in house strategic representative for Android, and Jen would be on iOS. So if I get a tablet, I'm getting an Android tablet. If she's getting a tablet, she's getting an iPad. Um, and that has worked out really well to always have devices available because um, although we use Browser Stack, um, which is a browser checker, sometimes it's really handy to actually have the physical. It's different. It can be different. Yeah. And I'm a fan of friends and family tasks. Yeah. Like, can you look at this website for me and see how it looks? I mean, sometimes like Browser Stack is so powerful, but just See, having someone else look at it, and even like that gives you some at least low level of user testing as well. Yeah, and um, what's my browser is really helpful.org is really helpful for clients. That's going to send you all the information about what their browser information is so that you can replicate it to test any bug that might come up. Like, hey, this is not showing anything on this page. You go, okay, this is a. Yeah, just send them that link. It'll give them a, a special link to send back to you, and it'll give you very detailed information about what version of browser, what operating system, what size monitor they're using, do they have JavaScript turned on, and that is usually invaluable because then you can use like browser stack, spin up a machine that is running the same thing, and usually find out what's going on. And not have to go back to try to find it. And Google, um, if, you're, if you're doing any analytics campaigns, um, the Google Analytics debugger extension is awesome at looking at what is actually being sent over. Okay, and then just really quickly talk about what kind of project management tools that we use. We use Slack for internal communication. Um, we are on some Slack channels with uh, some of the agencies that we work with have Slack, so we're on theirs. Um, email, of course everyone uses email. Google Docs, we all are our, pun our punch list um, is a living document that's in there. We use Google Docs for our functional specs and all our documentation. Trello keeps track of to-dos. You can have sort of a template and um, use that to replicate checklists. So every time you do maintenance every month, you just spin up a new Trello. And workflow is our like internal larger scale um, tracking everything. We have gone through a lot of project management tools over the years. We're lo-fi. 
You notice this is an incredibly lo-fi uh, <laughs> project management stack. Um, we have enough processes, we, we are people that have the habits that it works for us to do this, um, and it works for our clients to be um, hands-on, get into Google Docs. It doesn't have any spin-up time, but um, there are certainly people who need more, um, and, but this is what works for us. Yeah. Um, and we have a few other tools, like we have site monitors that run on all the sites that we host and send us text messages and Slack alerts when sites go down, so that's helpful. Um, that's a lot of information. Very quickly. Okay. So we are Shine with Decker. Um, we will put our slides up later in the day, as well as moving some of the content around just to make sure that the physical representation has the some of what we talked about in it. You can email us at hello at shiningdecker.com. And um, we are going into a break. So we are certainly around on the break if you want to have one-on-one -on -one conversations. But does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? I have one. When you're talking about using SAS, um, do you, is there something with WP Engine where it um, compiles it on, or do you just do all that compiling on your local? I do it all on my local. Just in the CSS app? Yeah, so I set it up, I use Gulp, there's Grunt, there's, um, uh, I used to use a, a piece of software that was like a GUI, um, now I just use it again, and stuff, yeah. And just push that out. Yeah, and then okay. commit my changes to the repository and it gets pushed out, but I don't have to deal with anything with that. That's one other question. You were talking about you're developing your front end and you're developing your back end. How do you successfully merge those two? So, that is a great question. One of the ways that we do that is, um, Something that we're working on, but it's it's we're midway through the path from being a fully test driven development shop. So this is the midway point. <laughs> is um, Jen actually goes in and she writes PHP, which outputs static HTML and puts in a couple of small variables of the things that are going to come from the admin. So advanced custom fields, you need to get something out of that field and then put it smart. So she's going to put variables in for that, that information from the functional spec and then just returns all of static output. Then I take it and convert it into more dynamic code with all the conditionals in place. So she writes static and so it's static markup and then it you gets in the program. Drop in the program. And then you turn that into an actual template. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So so the static markup is used like you just include it in the template, so you go through and create all the templates. Oh, so you create the templates first. And yeah, just create the template them. files and then include the guy. The well, we, we add that the other way too is You're working Sarah outside. just spits everything out onto a page, and I go through and say, well, this okay. needs a paragraph, this needs an H3, you know, whatever. Right. But I was thinking that you kind of were ahead of her. Yeah, yeah, if I'm ahead of her, I just go ahead. Of her. Yeah. <laughs> like placeholder, put the thing here. Got it. Yeah, we don't want to keep anyone. It is officially break time, right? <laughs> but happy to chat more if, if you would like.